Uh, I've been giving a version of this talk now for 17 to 18 years, and I always like to show this picture. It says Polarization of American Politics. Uh, my longtime co-author, Howard Rosenthal, and I started working together 33 years ago now. And this was our first paper on polarization published in the Journal of Politics in 1984. And uh, if you look at the dark uh, uh, crosshatch in the middle of this figure, I won't bother to bore you with the details. Uh, we detected the polarization beginning in, uh, in uh, I think the first year here is 1958 through 1981. And later, as we developed uh, better uh, systems of measurement, uh, we confirmed this early finding about polarization. So it's nice that uh, everybody suddenly has discovered it since uh, we talked about it for about 20 years uh, into empty rooms. So uh, this is the latest. Uh, I assume most people now are familiar with our work, so I won't belabor it. Uh, this is through uh, 2013, and as you can see, uh, the Republicans, this is the House, have continued moving to the right. The Republican caucus, this is the means, obviously, the Republican caucus has moved to the right every single election since 1976. Uh, the Democrats have slowly drifted to the left, that there, hence you get your asymmetric polarization, and I am in uh, great agreement with, uh, uh, with uh, Alan and, uh, uh, and uh, Michael. Uh, I'll only quibble with Michael about a bit about the redistricting, but basically uh, their findings uh, fit with how we found in Congress. And you can see the effect of the 2010 election in the, re in the Democrats, all the moderates that uh, Rahm Emanuel Man managed to recruit were wiped out. And as a consequence, we now have polarization that is as great as it was, greatest uh, since the end of Reconstruction. This is another way of sort of comparing our results with Adam Bonica. Adam Bonica was Howard's student at NYU, and uh, Howard asked me to be on the committee, and when I read the dissertation, I was absolutely blown away I think Bonica is probably the single best uh, uh, person in this area that I, uh, maybe other than Rivers. That's it. Bonica is just absolutely astonishing in terms of what he's achieved. And what this is, if you look at this, the, and I, uh, this goes to, uh, who was it that talked about the small contributors? Was that Michael? Michael. Yeah, you're going to love this. Just hang on. Um, uh, the uh, solid lines are, I believe, the CF scores that Bonica produces and the dotted lines are DW nominate and the, these have been normalized. Uh, if you do the differences, they get polarization. Then the CF scores and the DW nominate are correlated at 0.92. Here's the Senate, which tracks the House, obviously. And I think uh, my friend Sean will talk a little bit about uh, how the Senate, how, how the House has affected the Senate. And here's the overall polarization measure since uh, the end of Reconstruction. And in our work, um, we make a point of explaining uh, why we date this from 1879. Uh, younger people uh, remember that 1876, uh, the Republicans stole the election. It was stolen. Yeah, it's stolen. <laughs> Tilden won an, act, an absolute majority of the popular vote, and he came within one electoral vote of winning, and they set up this rigged committee, and they stole all the electoral votes, including one from my home state of Oregon, and Hayes became president. And of course, the House, passed, House approved this with a coalition of Southern Democrats and Republicans. So the first election after the withdrawal of the federal troops and this deal was 1878. So in all of our work, we date everything from 1879 on. And as you can see, the House is the most polarized since the end 
of reconstruction, the Senate is as well, and it keeps climbing. Uh, this is just a little graphic to, that I've used a number of years over a period of 40 years to kind of give people a feel of the asymmetry of the polarization. The top, uh, by the way, obviously I can't remember when McCain went in, but he wasn't in the Senate in 1971-72, uh, but I put him in there, So, and also uh, Senators Obama and Senator Clinton when they were both in the Senate together, and they were essentially indistinguishable ideologically. And you can see that, say, 40-some years ago, um, when I was out of the Army, um, the McCain would have been in the far, in the right tail of the Republican Party, and now he's in the left tail, whereas the Democratic Party, the sort of centrist group has disappeared, but it really hasn't moved dramatically to the left. Here's the uh, 113th. Uh, we had this on our blog. My, uh, I have a remarkable young man who's my uh, research assistant from Mississippi who's just brilliant, really nice kid, and he's just basically learned all this stuff by osmosis. He does everything on the Vote View blog. He did this, and you can kind of see, these are uh, Clinton, Biden, and Obama as senators, and uh, you can see that Cruz and Paul are in outer space. Um, also, if it shows up in the, uh, uh, on the screen, which I can't see, uh, the sort of dark blue is the Senate, the sort of darker red is the Senate, so that you, this is exactly what we as social scientists would expect. The Senate is more moderate than the House, which is something, that, the exception of Cruz and Paul. And you can see that um, uh, President Obama as a senator and Secretary of State Clinton as a senator were essentially right in the middle of, of the Democratic Party. Elizabeth Warren went, went, you know, has had a conversion experience and uh, is now basically uh, leading the, uh, uh, the Huey Long charge on the banks. It's too bad she didn't have that conversion experience about six or seven years ago. Read Political Bubbles, all right, which is our book on this. Uh, I want to get to in and come in equality, which you all know is an extremely serious issue. And uh, Thomas Piquet, I believe it's pronounced Piquette, uh, we discovered him, him and Sates in 1998, I think, is when they wrote their famous working paper. And then uh, Emmanuel Sates has a terrific website uh, at Berkeley, Berkeley Business School, I believe, or it was Berkeley Economics, and where he updates all the tables in that paper. The paper was published, I think, in 2001 or 2002. All right, so this is, in, this is the, income, the income quintiles before this meltdown of the economy, which is I rant and rave at students, and you have to read the last chapter of Political Bubbles to see uh, my transformation. And that is, it wasn't Google and Cisco, uh, Cisco and, and eBay and evil uh, McDonald's or evil uh, Sam's Club that brought down the economy. It was a gang of goddamn thieves. And the fact that, that uh, Goldman Sachs wasn't declared a criminal organization and forced it to, 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 uh, out of existence is a sad commentary about the two political parties which are wholly owned by the rich. I'm sorry, I mean, I've, I've given up, all right? All right, you want to see it. Here's, here's the Piquete Sates data, which is in our book, Polarized America, which we published in 2006, and we're working on a second edition. The thing to note here, this is the, the red line is the top 1%, and what Piquete and Sates did is use the Freedom of Information Act to get microsamples from the IRS, from which they then backed out the income distribution, which is their clever economists, so right, there's the, all the missing stuff at the bottom, but they figured it out. And this is the top 1%. I won't bore you with the details. You should read the paper, which is outstanding. But notice that, that uh, uh, from the period of 1945 to 2012, the correlation between 
this inequality and basically uh, inequality of polarization is 0.92. Uh, here's the Gini index, which my uh, amazing RA, his name is Chris Hare, by the way. He'll be on the market in this fall, <laughs> and he's brilliant, okay? He informs me that it's actually 0.96 now. So this is the Gini index. Uh, I didn't have time to add in 2013. This is the Gini index since the end of the uh, Second World War, along with polarization, another graph from polarized America. And this is absolutely, utterly outrageous. Okay, this is in a paper, you can, if you got your Google doohickeys, look, I, I, am, I can't see and I can't walk very well anymore, and all I do is go in and rant and rave at poor undergraduates. Um, <laughs> we wrote a paper for the, uh, for, uh, it's right here actually, Journal of Economic Perspectives last year, Vonica McCarty, Poole and Rosenthal, and I highly recommend you read it you'll be so pissed off after you read it that maybe something might happen. All right, so this is, the, this is basically all Adam Bonica, not me. Again, Adam Bonica is truly a remarkable uh, guy. This shows you the extent to which the rich run. Not only this city, but uh, when I first started as an undergraduate, 18 years old, naive, in 1965, I had a world politics professor who you stood in, down in the well of the auditorium and waved his arms and talked about imperial headquarters on the Potomac. Later, Lyndon Johnson sort of educated me about that. Um, but in any event, uh, this, is, this is from Adam's work. The dark line is the campaign contributions and from the top point zero one percent. They now account for 40 percent of the campaign contributions. The gray line is the actual percentage of the top 0.01 percent in terms of, 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 of uh, I forget, income. it's in the paper. What? Income. Income. Thank you. I can't see. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just simply can't see. This, this is a killer figure that Howard and uh, Howard and uh, Nolan and, and I don't can't claim credit for this. Um, this is the ideological distribution. This is uh, work again by Bonica. At the top are the billionaires. Okay, and all this BS by Harry Reid, who likes to slander people, but of course he can do that from the floor of the Senate, right? If he did it out in public, he might get sued. But then again, notice the evil Koch brothers are over on the right. That's how you pronounce it, by the way. Coke is in Coca-Cola. The evil Koch brothers are out on the right. Uh, but notice that the Democrats have their share of billionaires. The Google boys, George, George Soros. I looked up Ann Cox uh, Chambers one time. I forgot where she got her billions. Uh, when you get toward the... Uh, what? She's the daughter of Governor James Cox, who was the Democratic nominee in 1920. Dude. I'll vote for that. <laughs> the Cox newspaper. Okay, that's where the money came from. All right. She probably sold out the newspapers then. Okay. You get towards the center, and you'll notice you got uh, Paul Allen, uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon. Now, the reason why they're towards the center is they give but both sides. All right? You have to read the paper to see. They tend to give the both sides. Like they're Larry Allison, who keeps buying America, America Cups with those silly looking boats. I would ban those damn things. How ridiculous. <laughs> and Phil Knight of, of Nike fame from my home state. But you'll notice that the, uh, both sides have uh, lots of zillionaires uh, giving them money. But notice that the billionaires tend to be concentrated between the means of the two parties. We also show in the dotted line, solid dotted line, um, that Forbes 400, Fortune 500 people, and notice they tend to be, you know, distributed bimodally right around the party means. But 
uh, I think it was Michael, right? You said about the small donors. All right, this is for you, dude. All right, uh, copy, what's his name? We went on and went, dude, on Fox News. Small donors, small donors are the ones that are driving the loonies. All right, so you look in the, there's, you know, out, there's Alan Grayson is out there in outer space, who's rich, by the way, I think he's getting a divorce, right? Um, and then uh, Ron Paul and Michelle Bachman, and I'm quite certain that uh, Lies from the Pits of Hell, uh, Paul Brown is exactly the same thing. So it's the small donors, right, that are really extremists, whereas uh, the, solid, uh, the solid line, the top 1%, they tend to be bimodal and centered around the political parties. All right? So the problem we've got here is, is that uh, the rich really are running things. I mean, after all, uh, Dodd-Frank, those of you who have read about it, or ex experts about it, just read political bubbles. Dodd-Frank basically is full of loopholes that you can drive uh, an 18-wheeler through. And uh, they did nothing about the derivatives, folks. One last point. Ortsak, uh, who was the uh, CBO head uh, for President Clinton that came, President Clinton, jeez, I'm getting old. President Obama uh, left the administration and went, I believe, to Citicorp, which, by the way, if you go back far enough, is William Rockefeller's private bank, uh, William Rockefeller of the Standard Oil. Uh, he's now making three to four million dollars a year, uh, the champion of the little guys. Uh, namely, uh, uh, Dip Gephardt is worth 20 to 30 million. And let's not talk about the Republicans who are also zillionaires. In our book, we sort of list the who's who. They were on the board of directors of AIG, which, uh, thank you, suckers, uh, we bailed out with $180 billion, actually $185 billion. Supposedly, we got the money back. Ah, okay. <laughs>